Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to the Woodridge Library and our Zoom presentation, where tonight I will present to you perhaps the most plausible solution to one of the most vexing mysteries in Chicago history. The story of the Great Chicago Fire, a dreadful tragedy that destroyed nearly four miles of city landscape and rendered 90,000 people homeless on October 8th uh, through the 9th in 1871, has been told and retold in countless numbers of published books, articles, and pamphlets from 1871 up through the modern day. The question, however, which is most often asked, is who was the culprit responsible for starting the fire? There have been several interesting suspects and numerous theories advanced over the years, but the conventional wisdom points an accusatory finger at a skittish milk cow owned by Mrs. Catherine O'Leary, a poor Irish immigrant woman residing at 137 DeCoven Street in the impoverished Conley's Patch neighborhood on the city's near west side. Mrs. O'Leary, and uh, these are two uh, contemporary drawings of her, both rather unflattering, uh, went to her grave suffering the stigma and social ostracization inflicted upon her by the press, her neighbors, and generations of Chicago residents. As in many other tales of important historical events that tend to take on a life of their own, the real truth, I think, inevitably falls between the boundaries of rumor, accusation, exaggerated myths, legend, and truth. And so it would be for Kate O'Leary, but before we delve much deeper into the tragic circumstances of her life, let's first review the essential facts of the Great Chicago Fire. By 1870, Chicago's population had swelled to 298,000 people. It was the dawn of a remarkable period of prolonged city growth fueled by massive European immigration. By 1890, just 19 years after the Great Fire, over 1 million people resided within its city limits. Many of these impoverished immigrants that arrived had settled into densely packed, substandard uh, ethnic ghetto neighborhoods. William Deacon Bross, a teacher from Pennsylvania who made his way to Chicago in 1848, made note of Chicago's grimy appearance, calling it a, quote, slab city. Though he would go on to become a major promoter of the city and co-owner of the Chicago Tribune, Bross wasn't impressed with what he saw when he first arrived. Pigs and vermin freely roamed the muddy, garbage-strewn streets, which lacked paved sidewalks and property uh, drainage systems. Deacon Bross witnessed how green and black slime, quote, would gush up between the cracks, end quote, of the wooden sidewalks. He also lamented the state of the water supply, often finding minnows, quote, sporting in one's wash bowl or dead and stuck in the faucets. Can you imagine that? Connolly's Patch was an Irish enclave, a poor working class community sustained by its defining ethnic culture, family run businesses, and thousands of wooden shacks with dangerous flammable tar paper roofs in dwellings that these residents called home. Geese and wild dogs wandered down the uneven dirt streets where the chickens scratched. Children swarmed in the alleys, throwing pebbles at one another and making mischief in chaotic play, uh, slum play, if you will. Crime was, of course, endemic and prevailing anti-immigrant prejudices of the mostly Anglo nativist downtown city officials and business elites made upward mobility difficult, if not possible, to achieve. Serious friars were frequent but none would compare to the one that ignited on October 8th, 1871. That year, Chicago's summer and fall months were unusually dry with only one fourth the normal amount of rain falling between July and October. Many of the city's wooden buildings and sidewalks had dried out in the summer's intense heat. The Chicago Fire Department 
with only 185 men and 17 horse-drawn steam pumpers, were simply overwhelmed by a series of fires erupting across the city during those dry and arid months. A major fire the night before the big one on the 8th wiped out four city blocks south of downtown and had exhausted the overworked firefighters and damaged their equipment. A prophecy of the coming mega disaster framed in a public speech delivered by the famous lecturer George Francis Train on October 7th at Farwell Hall the night before foretold of a quote, terrible calamity impending over the city of Chicago. This is the last public address that will be delivered, Train ominously warned. When asked later if he was a seer or a prophet, he modestly replied that he had no connection to the spirit world or a gift of prophecy. His warning, he said, referred to the rampant crime, vice, and loose morality a foot in wicked old Chicago that would surely become the city's downfall unless drastic measures were taken. And here you see a photo of George Train. Uh, he was in Denver uh, when the reporters swarmed upon him uh, to explain what, if any, advanced knowledge he had of the fire, or if there was, an, in fact, a sinister plot that had been hatched to destroy the city of Chicago. Just southwest of the Central Business District on the Coven Street, Catherine O'Leary was getting ready for bed. Uh, this is the only known photo of the family house purchased by husband Patrick in 1864. Mrs. O'Leary was an Irish immigrant from County Kerry, and the couple ran a successful dairy operation from her modest cottage and barn, selling milk and milk products to the neighbors. She owned six cows, a horse, and a wagon. Husband Patrick was a Civil War veteran, mustered into the Union Army in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1864. They had five children, two of whom attended Catholic school at Holy Family, a nearby parish. Catherine, uh, it, it, she would uh, later say, uh, went to bed sometime around 8 o'clock p.m. the night of October 8th. The O'Leary's tenants and neighbors, the McLaughlins, meanwhile, were having a party to celebrate a relative's visit from Ireland. After drifting off to sleep, Catherine's husband woke her to alert her that a fire had started in the barn. More about that uh, shortly. Um, note the wooden sidewalks here and the, and the dirt street and uh, uh, the O'Leary house. And in the background, you see some of the other cheaply built wood frame balloon houses. Um, this was the kind of structures one found in the, in the, poor, uh, the poor economic uh, deprived neighborhoods of Chicago at that time. These side-by-side -side photos show, show, show a Chicago firehouse company in 1872 and a drawing of a hose cart nicknamed a Little Giant as it was racing through the fire district during the worst of the fire. Um, you see by my note underneath the left photo uh, that the wind that night was unusually high and it came in from the southwest. Uh, the fire was first spotted atop the courthouse at Randolph and Clark Street, right where City Hall is today. Fire spotter Matthias Schaefer sounded the alarm, ordering William Brown to strike box 342. And as fate would have it, was the wrong box a mile away from the O'Leary home. The city had established watchmen in these fire alarms that would in theory alert the fire department. But these protections when combined with human error were not foolproof. Schaefer spotted the fire, but he had incorrectly identified location. When he tried to correct the problem, the operator at the fire alarm telegram department wouldn't allow him to fix it, telling him that the firefighters would pass right by the real location anyway. A nearby shopkeeper who was in charge of an alarm system also dispatched an alert, but it didn't work. <clears throat> the fire department went to the wrong location. Worse, 
hoses burst and the water supply was low, given the terrible fire from the night before. Published accounts and memoirs from eyewitnesses later accused a number of firefighters of drunkenness the night of the fire, following a Sunday of relaxation and unwinding. Defending the valiant work of his men that night, uh, Chief, Fire, Chief Engineer Robert Williams declared that misdirected fire equipment had arrived too late and a steady wind from the Southwest carried the flames and blazing debris from block to block. The slums became kindling with the downtown conflagration where even the supposedly fireproof stone and brick buildings exploded into a fury of flames as the destruction relentlessly swept northward toward the, toward the Chicago River. By midnight, a few hours after the blaze began in Mrs. O'Leary's barn, the fire had reached the present day Chicago Loop. The flames could be seen from 40 miles away. Some witnesses described seeing what they were called as fire devils. Mayor Roswell Mason ordered the saloons closed and as the crisis reached the outskirts of downtown, he released all of the prisoners detained in the city Bridewell. Bridewell is basically another word uh, for prison or lockup. Mason's hastily scrawled handwritten note is shown here on the bottom of this image. Please release all the prisoners in a hastily scrawled note, he said. Meanwhile, inside the vacated taverns, Gangs of ruffians broke through the doors to guzzle as much free liquor as they could swallow before the fire caught up with the buildings. This is a map of the burned district, stemming from just north of Roosevelt Road up to North Avenue at the farthest northern point. On the first night of the fire, strong southwesterly winds fanned the flames high into the sky and created convection spirals. These were the fire devils that were referred to, self-generating worlds of flame and heated air. This is a uh, contemporary newspaper uh, drawing of the fire and the red shaded area shows the swath of destruction uh, and, and the path of the fire as it traveled. This is another image of the damage. The chart illustrates the extent of the rack and ruin, 17,540 buildings completely destroyed, an estimated 300 lives lost, and 90 to 100,000 people left homeless. While the fire had devastated the downtown, uh, parts of the west side, and much of the north side of Chicago, the stockyards and the lumber yards on the south and west sides uh, were mercifully spared and remained mostly intact. Most of the wharves, lumber yards, and mills along the Chicago River survived, as did two thirds of the grain elevators to the west. The industries surrounding agricultural, agriculture and trade kept the city's finances as stable as possible in the coming weeks and would later employ thousands of people during the post-fire period. Journalist Herman Kogan, whose son Rick Kogan uh, is radio talk show host and a columnist for the Chicago Tribune, aptly described the fire devils in his book about the Great Fire. As the fire devils spit burning debris in all directions, causing more buildings to burn, Kogan supplied a vivid account of the conditions. All the great downtown hotels and theaters leveled and the bell atop the county building crashing to the ground. Here we see some uh, images that were taken uh, right after the Chicago fire. Um, you can see the swath of destruction and the path. Uh, you see the streets are there, but essentially uh, it was a charred mass of twisted metal uh, uh, and, and horrific uh, fire smell that must have lingered for weeks. In the panic of that night, people fled northward, pushing and shoving to get across the congested and narrow bridges 
<coughs> spanning the Chicago River, refusing to believe that the fire would jump northward over the river. But in fact, it did. Along Oak Street Beach, families waded into Lake Michigan and huddled in water up to their noses in order to escape the fearsome heat <coughs> and the cinders raining down upon them. Several people reportedly jumped into open graves in Lincoln Park. It was then a, a public cemetery that was slowly uh, being excavated and the graves were in the process of being removed uh, over a period of years to other cemeteries on the north side. They jumped into those grave sites to escape the blast and heat of the cinders. Then, mercifully, rain began to fall on Monday, October the 9th. And the rain, combined with the lake and stretches of unbuilt lots on the north side, finally halted the wave of destruction by the morning of October 10th. Here are more uh, photos of the destruction. Uh, there are no known surviving photographic images in existence of the actual fire as it was in progress and as it devoured the city. This is Farwell Hall where George Train uh, delivered his famous speech the night before. Here you see uh, the public auditorium on the right and the ruined facade on the left. Uh, in those days, public entertainment uh, also uh, in addition to the theaters, featured Chautauqua lecturers, uh, orators uh, with different points of view who would come in. And they were, in fact, uh, celebrities of the age. Uh, Mr. Train was a very famous lecturer on a variety of subjects. He wasn't just a quack who had a premonition about the Chicago fire. Chicago Tribune publisher Joseph Nadil published a statement of encouragement to all citizens uh, uh, once the newspaper presses resumed service. He said, cheer up, Chicago shall rise again, he promised, and the people were encouraged. There's another view, I so apologize for the graininess of the photo, but uh, this is Lake Street as it looked before and after the fire. Here we see colonnaded buildings, building facades uh, that were made of brick and, and mortar that managed to survive uh, and some telegraphic poles. I think the photo is quite vivid. Uh, it was taken by one J.H. Abbott uh, and uh, it, I think it's one of the clearest photos that we actually have of the fire. Here we see the Chicago Water Tower and Pumping Station, uh, which was a famous landmark. And it was the only public building in the burn zone to survive, although other residences and structures uh, did survive, in fact. Um, 1918, the Water Tower was declared obsolete and it was nearly demolished. But because of its historical significance, it was uh, designated a landmark and uh, is really the only structure that still stands today in Chicago from the fire. The north side was particularly hit hard, although Malin Ogden, uh, who was the brother of Chicago's first mayor, William B. Ogden, uh, his mansions incredibly survived, uh, as did the New England Congregational and Unity uh, churches on Dearborn, uh, shown in the image below. Uh, uh, the Mal and Ogden residents, uh, of course, did not last into the 20th century, but uh, uh, it, it does show that indeed there were some structures that survived the fire. Here we see Rush Medical College opened at Grand and Dearborn in 1837. To the left is the college as it looked, and then you see many of the doctors and students uh, posing for this photo in, amid the ruins shortly after. <coughs> Joseph Medill, um, the optimistic publisher of the Chicago Tribune, who later became mayor of Chicago upon conclusion of Mayor Roswell Mason's term, uh, who ran on the fireproof ticket and was elected mayor of Chicago, uh, optimistically predicted that our city shall rise again from the ashes, and indeed it did. So who started the Chicago fire? 
and what really happened at 137 De Coven Street that night? And do we finally have a reasonable solution to this mystery? To sum up what we already know, <clears throat> the O'Leary's had retired at eight o'clock to try to get some sleep in the muggy October heat and humidity. Their labors would begin early the next morning. And these are some essential facts. Uh, uh, her dairy business was uh, kept in a small uh, shed in the rear of the property along with her horses. Um, she provided milk products and dairy products to the neighborhood uh, in poorly served uh, retail quarters of the city such as Conway's Patch. There really were no grocery stores, uh, not like we know them today. And individual residents would have often have little farms in their backyard and they would sell their produce directly to the neighbors. And in Mrs. O'Leary's case, she had her dairy business and was selling milk and butter um, and some hay products to the neighbors as was needed. Within 24 hours um, of the end of the Chicago fire, uh, reporters from the Chicago Journal and the Chicago Times, including reporter Michael O'Hearn, traced the origin of the fire to the O'Leary property at the Coven Street, where they discovered in a strange twist of fate that the O'Leary Cottage was the only building in the district to survive the fire. The newspapers, as they were wont to do in those days, vilified Mrs. O'Leary as an unpleasant old hag, as they called her, and mocked her with cruel illustrations while whipping up anti-Irish, anti-immigrant fervor in the city. When things went wrong, uh, the habit, of course, was always to blame the newcomers, uh, blame the immigrants for the ills of the city. And reportedly, a lynch party organized with the intent of tracking down Patrick O'Leary uh, and hanging him from a lamp pole. Uh, those rumors were also rampant, although uh, nothing apparently happened to either Patrick or Catherine in the immediate following days. The O'Learys sold their cottage in 1874 to a man named Kolar, last name Kolar, for the sum of $500. And they moved to South Halstead and 47th Street near the stockyards, then a very remote section of Chicago. Incidentally, Mrs. O'Leary, born in County Kerry in 1827 and married to Patrick in 1845, was not a weather-beaten old hag as the newspapers inferred. In fact, she was only 44 years of age. Author Mel Waskin submitted a bizarre theory about the origin of the fire that gained traction many decades later in his 1985 book, Mrs. O'Leary's Comet. He blamed it on a meteorological event, Belia's comet allegedly crashing to the earth that night, destroying not only Chicago, but Peshtigo, Wisconsin, and Holland and Manistee, Michigan across the lake that very same night. It's a far-fetched notion that has been discounted by scientists. And the fire in Peshtigo uh, on a much smaller scale, but nevertheless, no less damaging, uh, really was again due to the dry weather conditions and the likelihood that uh, somebody had set uh, some of the adjoining woods ablaze, destroying that town. But can you imagine when Peshtigo residents tried to uh, Telegraph Chicago, only to find out that Chicago was also on fire, they must have thought that the end of the world was at hand. Another theory, Lewis Cohen, a wealthy Chicago importer and charity benefactor, asserted in 1942 that it was he who started the fire while playing a game of craps in the O'Leary barn with son James O'Leary, Kate's youngest son, uh, at the time the fire broke out. The problem with this theory is that Jim was only nine years old at the time and Cohn was dismissed as a harmless prank, but the Medill School of Journalism happily accepted his $35,000 endowment following his death. In 
In his book, Mrs. O'Leary and the Myth of Mrs. O'Leary's Cow, author Dick Bales, a good friend and colleague of mine, conducted a deep dive investigation into the fire origin and came up with a compelling new theory, one that was endorsed by Alderman Ed Burke and the city council who formally absolved Mrs. O'Leary of any fault for starting the fire back in 1997. Dick, after meticulous research, attached blame to a hobo in neighborhood no account named Dennis Pegleg Sullivan. There you see Pegleg on the right, uh, and you note on his left leg, uh, he, is, he is disabled and he is walking with the prosthetic device. It was Pegleg uh, uh, Sullivan that Dick asserts accidentally ignited the blaze while attempting to steal milk from the barn, then fled. Um, Dick's book is excellent. I urge everybody to read it. Uh, however, we have a basic disagreement on the guilt or innocence of Pegleg Sullivan. Dick's book earned high praise for its originality and content, and deservedly so. It is lavishly illustrated and arguably the most complete account of the Chicago fire to be published to date. However, my own research reveals a slightly different version to Dick's theory, essentially though, involving the same cast of characters. In 1901, Mary Callahan, a young woman in attendance at the welcoming party held at the next door residence of Patrick McLaughlin on the night of the fire, revealed that she and Dennis Connors, now he was the man whose arrival from Ireland was being celebrated that night, along with a few of their friends, had run out of their milk supply, which they used to create an alcoholic concoction called milk punch. I would guess that's probably like a Kahlu and cream with the, the flavoring, I would think. The young people at the party did not wish to disturb the sleeping O'Leary's. Connors, a cousin of Pat McLaughlin, boldly declared that he would venture into the O'Leary barn and milk the cow. However, he did not know the first thing about cow milking and the nervous cow had indeed kicked over the oil lantern, setting the, far, the barn ablaze. In a curious aside to the cow story, following the fire, a man allegedly purchased the teeth of the charred dead animals and sold them as good luck charms. That's just a very bizarre curious side story, one of many uh, to come out of the fire, but I digress. As the flames exploded inside the small barn, in terror, Alice Riley, Johnny Finnan, Mary Callahan, and Dennis Connors raced back into the party, afraid to confess to what had just happened. They quickly swore each other to silence. Peg Lake Sullivan, meanwhile, lounging on the sidewalk across the street, spotted the flames bursting forth from the cow barn. He frantically pounded on the O'Leary front door to rouse them from their sleep, thus possibly saving their lives. So poor old Pegleg emerges as a hero of the play and not the scapegoat that Dick portrays him as. Catherine O'Leary Ledwell, one of Kate's daughters, affirmed that this version of events uh, was true in 1908 and again in 1933, as this newspaper clipping from the Chicago Tribune on the left attests. Somehow, some way though, Mary Callahan's story became lost and forgotten by the passage of time. I rediscovered it while conducting extensive newspaper research for my latest book called Tales of Forgotten Chicago, published just last year. Uh, the story of the uh, Dennis Connors involvement is one of the chapters in that book. I believe it to be true based on the statements of the people directly responsible for starting the fire. 
There was no reason for them to invent a tall tale and their decades of silence was born out of a fear of severe reprisal, which is very understandable. Uh, <clears throat> one of the young people fled uh, to Wisconsin a couple of days later, but in old age, they finally came forth with the confession. At that point, they really had nothing left to lose or gain. Denny Connors, well, he fled uh, from the city as well, returned to Ireland, died some years later. Uh, the story first surfaced in 1900, 1901, and the last reference to it that I found was in 1933. No books were ever written about them, although Bessie Louise Pierce in her very important and seminal multi-volume history of the city of Chicago makes passing reference to party goers near the O'Leary house uh, who were accused of uh, starting the fire, but that was the only thing she had to say about it. And, uh, and thereafter, really the story just kind of went fallow. I believe this version of events will withstand the test of time. Fate was not kind to the O'Leary family. Patrick O'Leary and Kate led reclusive lives in the Stockyards District, although a board of inquiry officially absolved Catherine of any blame for starting the fire in November, 1871. In the following years, Kate turned down interviews with reporters and steadfastly refused to be photographed. We don't know what she really looked like even to this day. She passed away from acute pneumonia on July 3rd, 1895 at the family home. Her earthly toils mercifully ended. She was preceded in death by husband Patrick who died in 1894 and was buried in an unmarked grave at Mount Olivet Cemetery. Their son, Big Jim O'Leary, who went on to become a powerful gambling boss in the Stockyards District uh, in the early 20th century, would later build a memorial to his parents with his accumulated riches. And uh, below in the center of this image uh, is believed to be a photo of Patrick in his younger years although I cannot really attest to that. I found this photo and I'm not really sure if it is him, but it perhaps could be. And then that was the Tribune drawing of old Patrick uh, uh, upon his death. And there you see the marker that Big Jim put up for his parents. The O'Leary's offspring suffered equally. Big Jim operated outside the law for much of his adult life by running illegal gambling operations at his Halstead Street Saloon, which stood directly opposite the stockyard's main gate. He had built himself a lavish mansion on Garfield Boulevard that still stands today, although in a state of disrepair. There you see on 55th Street, uh, that brownstone uh, that was the O'Leary Mansion, which was quite opulent in its day, and it's since been subdivided into various apartments. But Big Jim's son, Jim Jr., broke the old man's heart by eloping with the daughter of Captain Clancy, the stockyard's police inspector, who had closed down Jim's gambling den numerous times and harassed him for years. Uh, Big Jim could not stomach the thought of his son marrying the police inspector's daughter and later disowned him. And Jim Jr. Uh, moved to Indiana, um, but forever alienated from his father. Catherine's daughter, Mary, on the other hand, was accidentally shot by her own brother, Cornelius, AKA Con O'Leary in 1885 after the drunken Khan fired a shot at Mary's boyfriend, but missed, striking down his own sister with his errant shot. Khan, a roughhousing uh, saloon brawler, was apprehended uh, days later after he had hit, uh, 
took a ride on a train to Kansas City where he was arrested and was eventually sentenced to life in prison. The city in 1871 lay in ruins, a blackened landscape of ash, cinders, and twisted steel. Order had to be restored somehow, some way, to maintain peace and prevent wholesale looting and possible riots. General Philip Sheridan was dispatched to the stricken city to impose temporary martial law. He had come from the West where he had been involved in the various Indian wars in the post-Civil War period. There were few reported incidents of civil disorder and the next few weeks passed very quietly. Although there were some reports that there were indeed uh, lynching of looters, uh, I have not been able to find any evidence of that in my research. And in fact, it may be um, an apocryphal story. Uh, Sheridan's uh, professional and personal papers were also destroyed, although his home was spared. Mayor Mason issued a proclamation vowing to establish and maintain law and order. The promise of necessary supplies to feed and comfort the populace and the announcement that city hall business would be temporarily conducted at a congregational church on Washington Street followed. This is, uh, this again, here we see uh, photos of the destruction and then the mayoral uh, proclamation on the right. In the providence of God, <clears throat> to whose will we humbly submit, a terrible calamity has befallen our city, which demands of us our best efforts <clears throat> for the preservation of order and the relief of the suffering. Be it known that the faith and credit of the city of Chicago is hereby pledged for the necessary expenses for the relief of the suffering. Public order will be preserved. The Chicago Relief and Aid Society was a philanthropic charitable organization formed in Chicago in 1851. The society raised over 5 million from sources around the world to provide food, clothing, water, and fuel. Additionally, 5,000 sewing machines were provided to women so they could make clothes for their families. Medical care was also a high priority, and most notably, over 60,000 people were vaccinated against smallpox. In later years, the society came under severe criticism for its efforts to help the poor. It was the contention of the society that poverty was a moral issue rather than an economic or social problem. Uh, in other words, uh, if uh, you were unemployed, uh, you therefore must have had some criminal tendencies or you're prone to laziness. Uh, this was the prevailing 19th century view of the, uh, of the upper classes and of those who were so opposed to immigration in all its forms. Their post-fire housing strategies contributed to enduring patterns of ethnic and racial segregation that would continue really into our own modern day. Uh, Chicago became even more segregated by economic status after the Chicago fire than it really had uh, in the antebellum years um, before the Civil War and before the fire. Building contractors erected temporary wooden structures for the purpose of resuming commerce and private business. The I will spirit of the city was on full display during the frantic weeks, months, and years that were to follow. Here you see uh, some of these little shanties that were put up to serve as temporary office space. Uh, sometimes uh, they were real estate agencies. Sometimes they were selling uh, food and various goods uh, to people. Uh, this one, you can see in the distance, you can see the schooner ships in the distance there in the Chicago River with their tall mast sticking up in that one little uh, business that just had opened up there. William D. Kerfoot opened a real estate agency inside his wooden shack, bearing 
the sign, all gone but wife, children, and energy, end quote, her foot proclaimed. Deacon Bross confidently proclaimed that by 1900, Chicago was destined to become a city of a million souls. That bold and stunning prediction was achieved just 10 years later in 1890. Our city shall rise, yes, she shall rise, queen of the West once more. Old men, send your, summon, your sons, women, send your husbands. You will never again have such a chance to make money. Now is the time to strike. A delay of a year or two will give you an immense advantage to those who start at once. I tell you that within five years, Chicago's business houses will be rebuilt. And by 1900, new Chicago will boast a population of 1 million souls. Very optimistic, very prophetic. The rebuilding, those frantic eight years between 1871 and 1879. Chicago rebuilt quickly, everyone pitched in. After the fire, laws were passed requiring new buildings to be constructed with fireproof materials, such as brick, stone, marble, and limestone. These building materials, much more expensive than wood, were held together by mortar, a sticky, strong substance that ensured durability and fire resistance. Skilled masons were hard at work. And before the decade had passed, the city population reached a half million by 1880. In a year's time, Chicago newspapers glowingly reported the restoration of the central business district as the city transformed itself once more. In pre-fire days, Lake Street was the main hub of retail business. But after the fire, Marshall Field, Levi Leader, and others in their class succeeded in converting State Street into the famous shopping district that was destined to become. And Lake Street kind of dwindled um, in, in popularity as a retail center. And by the 1890s, you had the um, West Side L running right down the heart of, uh, of Lake Street. This is a peerless metropolis proclaimed the Lakeside Monthly as brick and steel structures arose everywhere. Optimistic city planners hope to create in this rebuilt city a utopia free of brothels, squalor, depravity, and gambling dens. This was not to be, of course, because along with the flourishing new storefronts, dens of iniquity sprouted all across the city. Uh, it was said that within a week or two, uh, houses of prostitution had already opened up in some of these hastily built wooden shacks. Chicago, despite hopeful uh, optimism and predictions that a new utopia was soon to be born, would never become a crime-free city as we all know. And noted on the bottom, in October 1872, there was one saloon for every 150 inhabitants. Some things just never change. The Chicago Fire gave rise to a new generation of skilled and imaginative young architects, including Daniel Burnham, John Wellborn Ruth, William Holabird, and William LeBaron Jenny, designer of the nation's first skyscraper located here in Chicago, the Home Insurance Building in 1884. There you see it um, in the center. Um, drawing. Collectively, these gentlemen comprised what came to be known as the first Chicago School of Architecture. And <laughs> as a result of their efforts, Chicago became internationally known as one of the major worldwide hubs of architectural innovation, from the steel skyscraper to the Bauhaus movement of the 20th century. The World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 was really less of a World's Fair celebrating the discovery of America than it was a great coming out party for the city of Chicago to showcase its renewal, its revival, and its vitality. This was a party 
of great magnitude. And today, all these, uh, this century later, uh, still is a source of it, continuous and endless fascination and books about the World's Fair of 1893 uh, con continue to be published uh, all the time. Uh, but again, with population, as, as noted here, 41% of foreign immigrants, mainly from Germany, Ireland, and the Scandinavian countries poured into Chicago with the Italians and Eastern Europe, Europeans arriving shortly thereafter. In 1874, during the period of the Great Rebuilding, a three-story marble-fronted residential dwelling developed by Mr. Kolar, who had paid the O'Leary's the $500, tore down the original O'Leary cottage and replaced it with this building, as you see uh, in its final stages before demolition. In 1937, the city attached a brass marker to the front of the dwelling, you see on the upper right, uh, uh, that was exactly the location where the O'Leary Cottage stood in the Kolar building, uh, which was uh, a three unit uh, apartment building um, would continue to stand. The city purchased this apartment house in 1928 with the hope of converting it to a memorial to the Chicago fire. But the neighborhood had rapidly deteriorated and went into a very, very quick decline and was reduced to mostly slum housing by 1954 when the entire block was torn down in an urban renewal effort. And the photo on the bottom I found shows the remaining uh, Kolar property just before demolition. Um, and uh, uh, the city though had other ideas about a, an appropriate memorial. And that, of course, would become the Chicago Fire Academy. In 1961, it took shape as the academy, and that occupies the site to this day. If you go there, you will find a sparsely populated area and experience a sense of what I would call urban isolation and desolation, I, which I think is understandable, given the setting and massive destruction of property and livelihood that occurred here once long ago. Um, there's empty blocks there. Uh, Manny's Delicatessen is nearby near Roosevelt Road, uh, but uh, there's a kind of a quiet repose to the whole area. And then you see the pillar of fire sculpture in front of the fire training academy. And uh, uh, it gives you a chance if you stop there to kind of reflect upon uh, this great tragic event of Chicago history that shaped um, the, our, uh, the future destiny of the city as well as our own destiny. In 1938, a motion picture depicted the Chicago fire and it was titled In Old Chicago. It was a highly fictionalized account of the O'Leary's starring Donna Amici and Tyrone Power. And it earned an Academy Award nomination it was a lavishly produced uh, motion picture, very costly uh, to produce, but uh, the story exaggerates the importance of the O'Leary's and, and makes the O'Leary brothers uh, 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 powerful political figures in Chicago, when in fact, Big Jim was only nine years of age. So it's, it's a fanciful uh, depiction. Uh, I might also add that uh, the Chicago History Museum uh, has a wonderful display of artifacts from the Chicago fire. Uh, there are, uh, there's a uh, 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 forks and spoons melted together in a block uh, that were taken from the fire and given to the Chicago Historical Society as it got going plus other artifacts, coins, stacks of coins that had melted together in the process. And um, if you have a chance, um, you should visit the Chicago History Museum. Uh, they have a brilliant diorama that has been there for many, many years that was wonderfully put together. It's one of a series of Chicago history um, dioramas that depict the epic of the city. It's pivotal. Uh, uh, game-changing moments uh, leading up to the modern day. 
This concludes my talk and I will be more than pleased to answer any questions or if any of you uh, have comments to share at this time, I welcome you. And I do wanna thank you for your time and your attention today. Great, thank you, Richard. That was uh, excellent. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you can type them into the Q&A at the uh, bottom of the screen. Um, and Richard, it looks like uh, we do have a question from uh, Mary. I don't know if you see it. Uh, no, I do not. Maybe you can read it to me. Sure. Um, Mary says, um, what is the documentation for birth and marriage years for the O'Leary uh, or that they were from Kerry? Uh, Patrick's obituary has a lot of inaccurate information. They did not move from Pennsylvania to Chicago after the Civil War. They were in Chicago on the 1860 census in the 10th Ward. Um, it's one of, it is known though that, uh, that Mr. O'Leary did volunteer and was mustered into, into uh, a Pennsylvania unit and that remains a mystery. We do not know why he went to Pennsylvania to enlist. Uh, there was a Chicago brigade that was organized uh, at the onset of the Civil War. Uh, and this was, uh, this remained one of the, uh, the mysteries and puzzles of it. Uh, and I can't answer it. I don't know why, um, but uh, much of this information has been called from various genealogical records. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, um, the Glessner House sponsored um, a uh, uh, depiction of the, of Mrs. O'Leary, uh, an actress uh, portrayed Mrs. O'Leary, and their team had done a lot of good research into the birth dates, the marriage dates of the O'Learys, and this was the information that uh, had been had come up through Ancestry.com and other uh, genealogical sources. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, here's one. Uh, do you think the rebuild of Chicago made the city more prosperous than without the fire? Absolutely. Uh, uh, the Chicago fire was a transformative event. Uh, it's doubtful, I think, that Chicago would re have reached its uh, prominence as quickly as it did. I think through the evolutionary process of history, the city would eventually become a colossal city of the world, but I think it would have taken perhaps a number of additional years. I think we can look upon Chicago today as a city of the world, and I think that um, that really began to come into its own in the 1990s when Chicago began reaching out uh, through the International Cities Program uh, and to begin uh, trade, uh, sending trade delegations abroad. Uh, I think the process would have been much slower. Now, one of the interesting things that I had heard uh, in my research is that when the city was beginning to plan the great rebuild, there was some talk of moving downtown further south, uh, more closer to Hyde Park to rebuild the business district there. And there were a number of aldermen at the time that actually supported such a measure but because of the proximity of the Chicago River to Lake Michigan and the nautical traffic um, and the schooners coming in and out of Lake Michigan, that was deemed um, ill-advised. And, uh, but again, it was discussed uh, about uh, downtown relocating to Hyde Park, but that of course was fanciful and never came to be. Um, would we have had a Chicago School of Architecture without the Chicago fire? Highly doubtful. The first school thrived in the 19th century. The second school came into prominence in the 1910s and was elevated to uh, uh, fame through uh, the Bauhaus movement of the 1920s and the 1930s. Okay, very interesting, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, just to clarify, your conclusion then is that the cause of the fire was the Irish family celebration next door to the O'Leary's Park? Yes, I believe that to be true. I wasn't there, I didn't see it, but from the available evidence uh, 
and the transcripts and uh, the references and the confessions that these people made 30 years later. Uh, I mean, if they were to gain something from it, uh, why wouldn't they have said something much earlier? Uh, they waited out a long period of their lives to come forward with this. None of them wrote a book about it. None of them did radio plays about it when radio was coming into vogue. They got it off of their chest, basically confessing the story to newspaper reporters who had sought them out. The curious thing about it is, is that how the story mysteriously died after 1933, uh, which was the last reference I could find to it in the newspapers. And uh, uh, to me, it's significant. And, you know, Dick Bales and I have had lunch and we've discussed this point and he blames it all on peg leg. Uh, I think peg leg, in fact, probably was a pretty good guy and not a, not a villain. Um, uh, and it was said, he believes that peg leg was either uh, smoking a cigar inside the barn. He had trespassed in there and the cigar ashes lit the fire. Uh, that, that's one theory of it. Um, but he was observed sitting on the, on the sidewalk stoop across from the O'Leary place. And uh, so either he went into the barn and lit a cigar and started the fire, or he banged on the O'Leary door and, and rescued them while the party goers next door uh, just <laughs> tried to cover up what they had done. It's, 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 a, it's a mystery, but I think it's a compelling answer and solution to it that will of course be left open to a lot of debate and interpretation. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and we have another question. Did the rebuild of Chicago uh, attract more people to come to Chicago uh, than actually scare people away? No, it didn't. It didn't scare people away. Uh, uh, there, the business interests of the East Coast recognized a, a great opportunity to do, to really rebuild from the ground floor. Um, oh, emergency goods were sent into Chicago, London sent in a library full of books and speculators, land speculators arrived from all over the country to buy up acreages of charred real estate uh, to, uh, to deal in land and to, and to create fortunes and, and um, the, whole, the whole boom of Chicago could not have been possible uh, without it. Uh, of course, the hardships rested with the people who were already here and how they had to rebuild their lives and to deal with the Chicago Relief and Aid Society who were more inclined to give money uh, to the people who were of substance and means who were living along the lakefront uh, uh, you know, park row uh, near, <clears throat> near the present site of, uh, of Grant Park and, uh, and Van Buren. That was the millionaire's row of the time of the, of the 1860s and 1870s. The uh, Gold Coast, as we know it today, did not really begin to take shape until the 1880s. But the wealth of Chicago congregated along the stretch of the lakefront from Roosevelt Road <clears throat> north to the river, and then were slowly beginning to build out the north side, which was the last area of the city to be fully developed. Uh, the Relief and Aid Society showed its biases by uh, giving more favorable terms to those people who had uh, uh, better economic means, spoke the English language, and uh, could trace their origins back to their Anglo roots. Uh, but with that said, uh, uh, the opportunity for people of vision, speculation, uh, and ambition was tremendous. And that's really what sparked Chicago's uh, exceptional growth. In 1889, uh, the city annexed into uh, the boundaries, uh, uh, the Stockyards neighborhood, which was then called New City, that became a part of Chicago. Jefferson Park uh, was annexed into the city. The town of Lake, which we now know as Hyde Park, was annexed into the city. So through, the, through that process, Chicago had doubled the size of its population within, a, within two decades. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
Um, another question, were practically all official Chicago records destroyed in the fire? Uh, in Mostly so. However, uh, there are some records that the Chicago History Museum has on file. Um, uh, Ann Burke had told me that there was in Springfield a box of, uh, of materials uh, that uh, was held uh, by, by either the Supreme Court uh, Historical Group or another Springfield governmental agency that when they opened up the box in our modern day, they could still smell the whiff of, of, of smoke and fire in the opened box all these years later. Um, but yes, most of the, so much of the, uh, the criminal records were destroyed, uh, a lot of birth and death information, a lot of uh, historical facts uh, that, had been, uh, that had been stored in old documents from the antebellum period dating back to the time of Fort Dearborn. All of that was lost, uh, but, uh, and that's why officially today doing research on Chicago history uh, before 1871 is very difficult because there just isn't much of it left. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have um, a question here. This kind of relates back to um, a question you answered a little while ago. Uh, still looking for actual source material on the O'Leary couple. Uh, there is lots of stuff on ancestry that doesn't pan out. O'Leary is a very common name. Can you refer me to the actors who did research? Uh, I would call the Glessner House for that if I were you. Um, there, the woman who played uh, Mrs. O'Leary is a good source. Uh, she goes by the stage name of Ellie Presents and you can look her up on the internet, uh, just key in Ellie Presents, and you might be able to reach out to her that way because she had some information that I was unaware of uh, pertaining to marriage and death dates, and she would be a good source to contact. Uh, she does various uh, historical interpretations of famous women in history, uh, including Phyllis Diller, believe it or not, and uh, she's a wonderful actress and uh, she gave this uh, benefit performance at Lesnar House. And uh, she had done a lot of research into the role of Mrs. O'Leary. And you might wanna check with her by looking up Ellie Presents um, through Google or through one of the other search engines. Um, Alderman Burke uh, over several times uh, beginning in 1897, uh, in 1980, 1997, excuse me, invited surviving members of the O'Learys to come into the city council chambers. Uh, he had a, a resolution absolving Mrs. O'Leary in 1997. And then a few years ago, when I was working as a speech writer, uh, I also prepared another resolution and the Ledwells and O'Learys are still around. Uh, they live in different parts of the country. Uh, I think there may be even as many as 30 O'Leary descendants are, that are out there. Uh, I can't tell you uh, individually uh, where they live or their contact information, but the family is in fact uh, still around. Very, very interesting. Okay, well, I think that's our last question. Um, Richard, I wanna thank you uh, very much for being with us this evening. Um, that, that was an extremely interesting uh, presentation. And as I've mentioned uh, uh, to some of you, uh, this particular presentation uh, has been recorded and will be available on the library's YouTube channel uh, tomorrow. And George, may I might add also uh, to get in a plug for my book, I have a chapter about this, my theory, uh, in my book, Tales of Forgotten Chicago, which was published by Southern Illinois University Press last year. Uh, there is a chapter on this, and uh, I, along with 20 other stories about Chicago, some famous, many more forgotten. And if you do have a chance, uh, I invite you to take a look. Thank you. Absolutely. And um, come to the library. We have a copy, and you can check a copy out here, or we can uh, interlibrary loan you a copy. So. Thank you very much, Richard. Have a good evening. Thank you, George. Take care. Take care.